What is going on everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Tonight's video I have several horrifying park ranger stories. If you dare to subscribe, do so now, because you may be asleep before you even finish this video. Now sit back, relax, dim those lights, and let's get spooky. I didn't know what to make of it at first. Just subtle, almost inconspicuous changes in my everyday life. Yet they left me with a nagging feeling I couldn't shake. As a park ranger, I've been working these trails for years. And I know every inch like the back of my hand. But on random occasions, they seemed different as if the very earth beneath my feet had shifted slightly, just enough to set my nerves on edge. I'd set out every morning on those familiar trails, those that I'd walked countless times. But every so often, something was off. A turn I swore I've never seen, a tree that seemed out of place, or a path extending far beyond its usual reach. It was disorienting, as if the very fabric of the park was shifting when I wasn't looking. Looking back, I still can't recall when exactly it all began, and I don't consider myself paranoid. But in hindsight, I have to wonder if a little of that could have changed anything for the better. After all, in my time I had seen plenty of what the uninitiated might consider odd, even bizarre. People would go missing sometimes, hikers getting lost or venturing too close to a ravine. One or two others I could remember were never found. Other times more than once, I radioed in a rusted out car, models that were decades old and seemed to have sat there for about as long, but no one could figure out when or how they got there. Then there would be the occasional abandoned campsite, usually by unscrupulous campers days prior. But the weird ones, those I still don't know what to make of them. Not just abandoned, but also out of place. Miles from any trail, where I'd find them while searching for lost hikers or scouting new routes, their contents typical and yet too decomposed for their age and the recent state they were in. The headaches, though, they were something else. They always started behind my eyes, a dull throbbing that gradually grew, spreading like a dark cloud over my thoughts. I'd sit in my truck, parked under a canopy of ancient trees, clutching my temples, hoping the pain would recede, but it never did, not entirely. Even at the time, I knew it wasn't just work stress. I tried to self-medicate, even broke down and went to the doctor. But whether it came in a bottle of liquor or a pill, medicine didn't help. The episodes were no less frequent or more predictable, and as hard as I tried to keep it together day to day, people began to notice. Hey Jim, you uh, you don't look so good, you alright? My friend and fellow ranger Eric asked, a look of concern growing as he scanned me up and down. Yeah, fine, I sighed, just a headache. You sure? You don't have to come with me today, he said. I'm not even sure what I'm looking for up there anyway. But they were last seen up in that area a few days ago when they ran into those kayakers we interviewed. So I'm just going to make a pass and see if there's anything to it. But right now, we can't even locate the car they came with. Mary, over at the lodge, told me they checked out already. Could be they just left without telling anyone their plans. Nah, I groaned, raising to my feet. The lady who called it in, someone's mother... She sounded pretty distraught. She swore they were supposed to be back home by yesterday morning at the latest. I'll be fine. 
Suit yourself, Eric replied. There's some aspirin in the truck if you need it. I want to be back before dark. No sense wandering around out there when we can't see anything without a mag light. I nodded, willing myself to the door with whatever coffee I had left in my system. The drive up the mountain wasn't long, but I wasn't in the state to handle the meandering little road that slithered up its sides in a way that would make you forget he was even paved. By the time I climbed out and looked around, I had a fair bit of nausea to add to the throbbing pain in my head. All right, Eric announced, spreading a well-worn map at the park over the hood of the truck as if it was a canvas. He began tracing his finger back and forth through foot trails that crawled out like spider veins from the main road where we stopped. The kayakers said they ran into our missing hikers somewhere along the trail here. As far as they could tell, they weren't in any distress. They were just heading this way. If they were coming in this direction, shouldn't their car have been somewhere nearby? I interjected. All these trails near the river converge in a few places between here and there. Could be, said Eric. Unless they made it to the car and went somewhere else. I'm going to head northeast towards the river and then follow it to the bridge along the main road. I want you to check the area around the trails here in the other direction. If you can't make it to Eagle Point within the next few hours, turn back so we can make sure to meet back at the truck before dark. Keep your radio on and let me know if you see anything unusual. Sure, I responded. Shouldn't we bring in search and rescue? I can't justify it without at least doing a thorough sweep ourselves first, Eric lamented. Right now, we can't even say for certain they're still in the park. And if we could find anything to narrow down this search area further, they're going to want that information. I nodded grabbing my pack from the back of the truck and slinging it over my shoulder as I turned towards the path that led down into the woods. I'll keep you posted. Anything else I should know? I asked. Sounds good. You know about as much as I do, Eric replied. Thanks for your help, Jim. It didn't take long for me to lose sight of Eric and the truck as we went our separate ways. The area was vaguely familiar to me, though I couldn't remember if I'd ever taken this particular trail before. Occasionally, I ventured into a clearing or animal track to check for trash, gear, blood, anything that might indicate a human being had recently been there. Nevertheless, I couldn't shake the feeling Eric was right about the couple I was looking for. Maybe they really did just leave. If they were missing, Who's to say they weren't stranded somewhere along the old highway leading out of the mountains and back to civilization, where the state police should be searching for them? I mean, we had reported the case as soon as it came in, but as far as the cops knew, there's no sign they had returned from the park. My thoughts were interrupted by streams of light penetrating the dense forest. I could hear the river in the distance and wondered how Eric was getting along. I should have been more close to Eagle Point by now, at least according to the GPS. But something was... off. The trees themselves began to take on a spectral quality. Their leaves shimmered with an eerie, unnatural light, like a translucent veil concealing a hidden world. I stumbled upon an ancient, gnarled trunk, its bark festooned with grotesque shapes that seemed to pulse and writhe. The vegetation around it was unlike anything I had ever seen before. I could best describe it as both dead and alive, a grotesque mockery of nature. It was then I realized I couldn't hear anything. No birds, no insects, not even the wind. The silence was so heavy it felt suffocating. My head was pounding ruthlessly, and I regretted not bringing the painkillers from the truck. As I took a swig of water and steadied myself against the monstrosity, I looked behind me towards the trail and stopped in my tracks. The uncanny, 
ethereal landscape seemed to stretch for miles in all directions. Even in the state I was, I knew I couldn't have gone that far from the trail. I checked the GPS again, and sure enough, it indicated I was more or less where I expected to be. Still, I couldn't recognize any of the ground I had traversed. Apart from turning around and walking back the way I was sure I'd come, I couldn't tell which way the trail could be. I sighed in pain and bewilderment, reaching for my radio. I gritted my teeth and pressed the button on the side. Not just because my head was killing me by now, because I could hardly believe I had made such a rookie mistake. Eric, it's Jim. Come in. Static. Eric, it's Jim. I'm somewhere close to Eagle Point off trail, and I think I need help. Do you copy? Static. A flash of anger and helplessness took a hold of me, as I thought of Eric reminded me to keep my radio on. There was no way we had time to get out of range, at least not on foot, even if I wasn't where I thought I was. I called again and got nothing. Though it didn't seem to be getting dark yet, I knew I needed the start now if I wanted to get back before then. Relying on the GPS, I retraced my steps. But the closer it indicated I was getting to the trail, the less I recognized my surroundings. The ground felt strange beneath my feet as I walked, like it was absorbing the sounds of my footsteps. The unsettling dread of this place was unlike anything I had ever felt before. It wasn't just the bareness, the absence of wildlife or the oppressive stillness. I had gotten turned around and lost in the past for brief periods while hiking alone, but that had only happened when I was much further off trail than I was supposed to be by now. None of this had made any sense. It was as if this patch of land existed in a reality of its own, governed by its own rules, unknown and malevolent. Sure enough, the GPS soon showed my location as nearby right on top of where the trail was supposed to be. But as I looked around, suppressing the fear growing inside my chest, I might as well had been hundreds of miles away. I kept trying Eric on the radio, with the same result as before. It should have been getting dark by now, and I should have been well on my way back to the truck, where I was sure Eric would be waiting before long. But nothing was as it should be. I sat down on a boulder that looked like it had been consumed by some kind of blackish, veiny growth that reached down into the soil. Exhausted and dizzy, hunger pangs joining the pulsating blows inside my head. If I didn't figure out what the hell was going on soon, I'd have to confront the reality of spending the night alone, lost in this alien place. Then I saw it. No more than 50 feet away, stashed in a clearing that was nowhere near any discernible path, was a blue mid-size SUV, matching the description of the vehicle that belonged to the missing couple. How could I have missed that on my first pass through here? I rose cautiously, trying to figure out how it was even possible for any vehicle to have made it out of wherever this was, let alone without leaving behind any apparent tracks or even disturbance to the surroundings. I checked the GPS again and saw I was supposedly near the main road, not far from where we had left the truck. I yanked the radio off my belt. Eric, come in, it's Jim. I think I found it. I think I found the car. Do you copy? Static again. Eric, come in, it's Jim. Please, I... I took my finger off of the button and cursed under my breath. Useless. I resolved to check it out for myself. Maybe I could figure out where they went. More importantly, I might be able to at least drive it back to the road and find the truck in the off chance they left a key. But the closer I got, the more confused I felt. The missing hikers were last seen just days ago, 
and they hadn't arrived at the park for more than a few days before that. Yet what I was seeing looked as though it had been left there for months, maybe even years. I slowed, fairly certain this wasn't what I thought it was. But as I closed the gap, I could see the plates matched their car. This, this can't be, I muttered to myself, almost hesitating to reach for the door like it was some kind of trap. A chilling otherworldly shriek pierced the silence. So suddenly, my whole body flinched and I fell down in shock. It was a high-pitched, inhuman wail that somehow managed to penetrate the Dricronian calm, reverberating through the forest like a bell. I've heard the calls of countless animals in my time, but this? Before I could collect myself, it rang out again, closer this time. My head throbbed harder than ever, and I was overcome by inescapable vertigo. My symptoms intensified as whatever this thing was closed in. I clawed my way towards the car, raised myself up to the handle of the near passenger door, and threw myself inside. I don't even remember turning to close the door behind me before I passed out, just as the howls of my pursuer reached the clearing. When I came to, I struggled through what felt like a nasty hangover to get my bearings. Blurry-eyed and disoriented, I scanned the thick layer of dust that covered the interior, choking on a few hours worth of stale air. I finally tried to sit up when I noticed it. I sat straight, leaning closer. Two sets of what looked like human eyes sat neatly on the dash, viscera still attached like they had been pulled out and placed there. I didn't even have time to inspect the body splattered across the inside of the windshield before my gut sent me flying out the door, retching uncontrollably. Then I froze, remembering yesterday's events. Or was it yesterday? I wasn't sure. The forest was deadly quiet again. No sign of whatever had made those awful noises. The same almost artificial light streamed through the thick woods, as though hardly a moment had passed since then. My pack was still on the ground where I'd left it falling down, and I checked the radio. I tried every channel I could looking for Eric or, well, anyone at that point. But all I found was that the battery was low. But how? I had grabbed the radio off the charger back at the station before I came up here. How long had I been out for? The battery should have lasted for weeks, if not months. I regained my composure and checked for keys. My heart leapt as I heard them jingle in the ignition, but immediately sank when I turned it over. Apart from the keys themselves, I didn't hear a sound. The car was dead. I'd have to walk out of here, wherever here was. I tried the GPS again, and did my best to follow where I thought the main road should have been. But it wasn't. I saved the location of the car, and hoped I'd be able to bring back law enforcement to collect the evidence of what could only be a crime scene. Little did I know, that was nothing compared to what laid in store. I trudged on, racked by hunger and with a dwindling supply of water. I hadn't packed any food since the plan was to be back the same day. According to the GPS, I was supposed to be well within familiar territory by now, and not too far from the station. But everything around me was no more familiar than if I would have been dropped onto an undiscovered continent. Fluorescent mold carpeted patches of the earth like blood spatter under a black light. Everything around looked to be in the state of death and decay, yet alive and pulsating with a synchrony that made me wonder if it was just my head or the earth itself. No matter how far I walked, I never saw or heard a single living thing nor any sign of a trail or pathway. I made a beeline for the station, but never seemed to get any closer. 
All the while, there was that growing sense gnawing at the edges of my cautiousness that someone or something was watching me. Strange marks and patterns were etched, no, burned into the trees. Symbols that defied all understanding, yet alluded to hidden meanings. I tried to focus. I had to keep going, somehow. Something terrible had happened to those hikers, and one way or another, I had to get... Splat. I staggered and lost my balance on something slippery and wet as a vicious mass hit me in the head from above, toppling me to the ground. Dazed, I raised my hand to my face and gagged, seeing the foul mucus that now coated it in a thick layer. More of the same ran down my face and back, and I struggled to wipe it from my eyes. I reached out to steady myself against a tree so I could stand, or rather, what I thought was a tree. What should have been rough bark of some variety instead had a fleshy texture that gave way under my grasp. I jumped up, startled, when a cacophony of groans seemed to emanate from it in a crescendo. I pulled my hand away to see deep red rivulets mixed with the mystery goo. Reeling back instinctively, I saw where it was all coming from. This tree was more like a profane amalgamation of what looked like human body parts, twisted and smashed together into something like a tree. Arms, legs, torsos, even heads with mouths agape that were likely the source of the haunting sounds. The disgusting mass seemed to recoil in kind, sending even more of the mucus oozing off its branches and down the trunk I had just been leaning on. I stumbled over a small, square object that slapped wet against the mossy, fleshy surface of the ground and contrasted with its fluorescence. A wallet? I bent down to pick it up and could just make out the name of the ID inside. It belonged to one of the missing hikers. I choked down bile as the implications sent my stomach heaving all over again. In my state of shock, only one thought kept running through my mind. I've got to get out of here. Hoisting my pack higher towards my shoulders, I grabbed the straps and started running. I don't know where to, or even how long I could keep it up. But everything I was seeing, what I could process of it anyways, told me I had to. Miscellaneous belongings were scattered all around. Backpacks, sleeping bags tents, old cameras, trash, food, even a steering wheel and a tire, all in various stages of decay littered my path as I ducked and dodged unimaginable horrors like the tree that wasn't a tree. Pools of blood-red liquid, creeping, writhing viscera, bushes of blinking eyes and shrubs composed of what appeared to be antlers, fur and rotting meat greeted me at every turn. The pain in my chest grew harder to ignore with each step, and my pounding head sapped any strength I may have had. My pack grew heavier and I slowed. I eventually collapsed to the ground in surrender as the load slid off, thudding onto the ground behind me. The forest floor felt warm and inviting against my face as it sunk in like a pillow. The cadence of its haphazardly fluorescent covering seemed to hold my body in place as I willed it to move. The harder I tried, the faster my strength seemed to drain from me in waves of drowsy oblivion. The relief I felt when my headache began to subside was so sublime, I almost gave in for sheer gratitude in that moment. But then, I heard it. That same horrible shrill roar jolted me to my senses, familiarity triggering my adrenaline. A second closer this time sent me sprawling to my hands and knees. I clawed desperately at the ground, too skittish to take my chances with my surroundings again. By the time the third rang out and picked up its cadence, I made it to my feet, running as fast as I could. I didn't stop to think about the pack or the fact I was fleeing my only source of supplies. 
I didn't think about my burning legs, or even the throbbing ache that returned to my head as I sucked in ragged breaths. I just ran for my life. I fled that god-awful noise with everything I had left in me, and yet, it seemed to grow closer and closer, just like the first time I heard it. There was nowhere to turn, no path, or car, or anything I dared try to hide in. Fear forced me forward, hopping over and around monstrosities that barely registered at this point. Just when the howls reached their deafening zenith, and the eyes I could swear were boring into the back of my skull told me it's over, I turned to look at my pursuer. Maybe it was a reflex I could no longer stifle. Perhaps I instinctively turned to fight when I thought I was going to die. Crash. Before I had a chance to find out, I found myself tumbling head over heels as blinding lights spun into green grass, over and over in the field of view. I landed flat on my back, knocking the wind out of myself as I stared up at the most beautiful blue sky I had ever seen. I laid there, stunned, afraid to move, afraid to think. The eerie, grim silence was replaced by birds singing from the tree line. The wind gently swept through the green grass at the bottom of the hill where I had ended up somehow, where insects chirped and hummed. I rolled to my side, searching frantically for whatever had been chasing me. I looked all around, but just like the last time, whatever it was had suddenly vanished as quickly as it had appeared. With the immediate threat apparently gone, my body rudely reminded me of its condition. I hurt everywhere, and something was wrong with my skin, besides minor cuts and bruises. It was different, dried, almost leathery, cracked, and looser in places it shouldn't be. I felt more than exhausted, drained. Though my usual headache had dulled for the most part, I still struggled to get to my feet. When I steadied myself enough to notice the ranger station in the distance, I couldn't have jumped for joy if I had wanted to. All I could do was start walking. Slowly, painfully, but determined to get to safety at last. I looked behind me where I'd crash landed from, but it might as well have been the moon. From where I stood, there was no sign of anything like what I had just gone through for what seemed like a day or so. Were it not for the intensity of my hunger and thirst, or the dried goop still stuck to my tattered uniform, I could have doubted it myself. All I knew for certain was that I could see the ranger station up ahead, but hope turned the rage when I saw Eric's truck parked out front. He had left me there. What else could it mean? To think he didn't even bother to stay and look for me? That had to be the reason I didn't find the truck or any sign of him when I came back. But why hadn't he answered me on the radio? Was this some kind of sick joke? I threw open the door to see Eric sat at his desk, mouth ajar, and color draining from his face. What the... Uh, oh god, oh my god, Jim! Is that you? What in the... Where? Eric stammered, visibly shaken as he stood from his chair. He met me across the floor tentatively, like he wasn't too sure whether I was a ghost. I wound up to punch him square in the mouth, but only succeeded in knocking myself off balance as my useless body crashed again in a heap. He awkwardly clutched my arms to arrest my collapse, hosting me into the chair beside me. All right, all right, hey, easy now, Jim. It's me, it's Eric. I know damn well who it is. I shot back. You, you left me. Jim, I, just take it easy. You've been through a lot, clearly. Are you, well, hurt? Eric asked reassuringly. Am I hurt? I chuckled with mockery. Am I hurt? Well, let's see. First, there was the fact that you never answered me on the radio after you reminded me to keep it on for exactly that purpose or even came looking for me when I wandered around with no food and barely any water for hours, maybe even a couple of days. I don't know. No, 
you just hopped in the truck and ditched me there because there was so many important things to do sitting around here. I raged, gesticulatingly as wild as my frail frame would allow. Jim, buddy, here. Eric interrupted himself, handing me a bottle of water. My pride couldn't hide the desperation, my hands shaking uncontrollably, raising the bottle to my lips. I gulped greedily mouthfuls as he continued, trying to hide the look of pity and disgust on his face. I could call an ambulance, but they're going to take a couple of hours to get up here. Let me at least drive you to the visitor's center before they close. That way you could get checked out at the clinic and wait there. No. I spat between gasps. I don't need your help anymore. I quit. And I'm suing you in this whole damn place. You left me there to die. Now, Jim, just calm down. Please, really. Eric pleaded, handing me some jerky and trail mix from the cabinet. When you didn't come back before dark, I called it in and set off searching for you myself for hours. We scoured the woods for days and even nights. Honestly, did you really think I would just abandon you like that? Yeah, right, I retorted, though food and water had settled my anger considerably. There's no way in hell you did all that before I walked back here on my own. Lying just makes it worse. Jim, Eric protested. I'm not saying I don't believe you, but are you sure you're remembering right? I scoffed. Don't try to turn this around on me, you crazy bastard. It's too late. I survived. I'm back. Jim, Eric said again. You've been missing for three weeks. A little over, actually. That's impossible, I shouted, and tried to raise myself from my chair, some strength finally returning. But Eric cut me off. My friend, Eric said, how long have we known each other? How many years? Do you really think I would do this to you? For what? Come on now. You're probably delirious after what you had been through. I muttered under my breath readying another salvo, but he continued, sighing. Look, if you don't want to go to the hospital right now, we could talk it out, but you need the rest at least. Eat and drink some. I'm sure you know that as well as I do. I don't need no damn wet nurse, I said. You have no idea what's out there, what I've seen. People are in danger. I found the car, Eric. Oh God, their car, their eyes. We gotta, we gotta have to do something. Jim, please, Eric said. Tell you what, I'll make you a deal. It'll be dark soon. I'll put a fire on. You could help yourself to some more food and water and tell me all about it. Then you'll let me drive you to the visitor center. From there, you could decide if you're okay to drive home or to a doctor. I resented being treated like some kid who got sick at school but I reluctantly agreed, convinced by my aching exhaustion. As he sat about lighting the stove, I spilled everything. Getting lost, calling him on the radio, finding the car, being chased by that howling, monstrous creature. I left out most of what I could remember about trees made from missing campers or shrubs from unfortunate wildlife. I skipped over the inescapable feeling that, whatever that place was, it was something unnatural, profane. Eric doubted my mental and physical health as it is, and I was in no mood to take a trip to the hospital on a ranger's salary. I focused on the timeline, certain there was no way I could have been gone, let alone survived out there for three weeks. I showed Eric the spot saved on the GPS where I'd found the car and he agreed to go take a look at it the next day. But he sounded more non-committal than what I anticipated, having told him about the body parts on the dash. I finally stood to stretch my legs, and thought about heading over to the couch for the night instead of going back out into the frosty autumn evening, when I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the window. I rubbed my face, wondering if the sagging, grayed visage before me was some injury or a cruel trick of the light. Hey, where are you going? Eric asked, surprised to see me hurrying to the washroom. 
Wait a minute, Jim. He called after me as I reached the mirror. An involuntary cry of terror and disbelief escaped me. My face, my body, all of me looked so much older. Middle-aged as I was, I was used to seeing a few new greys or the occasional wrinkle appear overnight. But this was different. It looked like I had spent a decade or more out there since I'd last seen myself. Patches of fine grey wisps tumbled down to my shoulders and a scraggly beard of the same hue covered my face. My eyes sagged and the skin around my chin and neck hung loosely from my skull. I just stood there, rubbing, tugging, and scratching at this stranger in the mirror, muttering incoherently. I'm sorry, Jim. I'm so sorry, Eric said, standing in the doorway. This wasn't supposed to happen. I didn't know. I swear to you, I didn't know. I stared silently at the face in the mirror. Eric's voice sounded distant and incoherent, too dissociated from whatever reality I was trapped in at that moment to be understood. I think, I mumbled, interrupting the monologue, I think I should go to the hospital. Uh, yeah, Eric stuttered with relief. Yeah, Jim, that's a good idea. Let's do that. I barely registered the crisp night air greeting me as I stepped out from the warmth of the cabin, but it did seem to restore some of my faculties as I climbed into the truck. Shotgun! I barked with a wry grin. Eric chuckled nervously. Of course. We sat in silence for a bit, the moonless night offering no assistance to the headlights blazing a trail down the mountain. My chauffeur winced when I finally spoke. So, how long have you known about this? I stared across the cab, watching him rub the back of his neck like it was a magic lamp with the answer he was looking for. No more BS, just tell me what you know. Well, it's like I was saying, he began. I had always heard stories, but this was back then, you know? I was just starting out, before I even thought about running things around here. The guy who was at the time, I forget his name, he was the one telling them, swore he saw things out in the woods, things that shouldn't be there. No litter or abandoned pets, but something. I know. I interjected flatly. Who else knows? How long? Jesse? Frank? Lisa? No, nothing like that, Eric insisted. It was just stories. And it was before even your time with us. I told you, I didn't know anything like that was really out there. How could I? I scuffed. Is my face just a story too? Awkward silence resumed until the silhouette of the visitor's center emerged from the roadside. Just drop me at my truck, I said. I could drive myself. Jim, come on, Eric said. I said I'm sorry. It's not about that, I interrupted. I just need to clear my head. After some resistance, he relented, pulling into the parking lot. I'll let the others know that you're in the hospital tomorrow when we regroup from the other stations. He called after me as I stepped out. I turned to face him. Yep, I don't think I'm going to make it in, boss. I jabbed, closing the door. Are you going to tell them what happened? Eric glanced down, hesitating. Uh, yeah. You rest up and you let me know how you're getting along. We could talk about disability insurance to hold you over the rest of the season, if the doctor recommends that route. I don't think there's any reason to rush things. People have to know, I responded. They gotta close the park, Eric, at least for a while. You know that. Convince whoever you have to. Whatever's out there is beyond dangerous. I'll handle it. You have my word, he assured me. Good night, Jim. With that, 
He turned and headed back in the direction of the park. Alone with my thoughts again, I wondered how my boss could manage to be so nonchalant about what happened. Even if he still didn't believe a word I said, there was no denying my impossibly physical state. And what about my coworkers? The more I thought about it, the less it made sense. By the time I made it to the hospital, I thought about continuing the rest of the way home, whether I'd really be missing for days or weeks. I hadn't slept since passing out in the car that belonged to the missing hikers. I reasoned I shouldn't be driving alone at night, sleep deprived and possibly injured or sick. In the end, I decided Eric wouldn't let me come back to work if I didn't get checked out, and I very well could need medical attention. At first, I was pleasantly surprised to see the deserted parking lot as I pulled in. Hopefully it meant whoever was on call wouldn't take too long to have a look at me. Even now, I still kick myself for not being at least a little suspicious, especially after everything I had been through. As I walked through the automatic doors, the sounds of my footsteps echoed through an empty room, breaking the eerie silence. It was late, sure, but this was the only hospital for miles. How could I be the only visitor? The hallway stretched before me, lit only by the dim glow of flickering overhead lights. The linoleum floor was scuffed and worn, and the walls were lined with dull beige paint. The automatic doors slid shut behind me with a soft thud, trapping me in this eerie stillness. The place had a sterile and slightly antiseptic smell, but underneath it, there was a musty and stale odor that lingered. The scent of old books and neglect filled the air, adding to the unsettling atmosphere. It was dimly lit, with only a few flickering lights illuminating the path ahead. A flash of movement at the end of the hallway caught my attention, and I made my way towards it. As I got closer, I saw a figure hunched over a desk, scribbling something furiously. Excuse me? I called out, my voice echoing in the empty space. The figure looked up, startled, and I saw that it was a woman, her hair in a messy bun and her glasses sliding down her nose. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, I said, making my way over to her. I was just wondering if there's anyone here who could check me out. I think I might be sick or um, injured. The woman looked me up and down, taking in my ragged appearance. Take this and have a seat, she said finally, the gravel in her voice betraying what I assumed to be a prolific smoking habit. Someone will be with you shortly. She handed me a clipboard and a pen that looked as worn out as the yellowed intake forms. Thanks, I responded, sighing. I knew I should have just gone home. I turned the survey a room of empty chairs, their stale fabric ascended by an aged turquoise hue. Do you know about how long it'll be? I asked. Where the hell is everyone? She didn't even look up. Sir, you need to have a seat and fill that out like everyone else. Someone will be with you shortly. Got it, I responded, rolling my eyes and motioning towards the empty waiting area, just like everyone else. I took the clipboard and pen and made my way to the chairs. As I sat down, I glanced over the form. It didn't take long for the lines to blur together as the throbbing behind my eyes were turned with a vengeance. I swore under my breath. Ma'am, I, I really don't feel well. Is there someone? Anyone? No response. I set the paperwork down in defeat. The distant scratching sound of the woman's furious scribbles continuing could be heard. As I waited, I felt my eyelids getting heavier. The exhaustion was finally catching up to me. I tried to fight it, but my body had other plans, and soon enough, I drifted off. I don't know how much time passed before I felt wads of paper periodically thudding against my face, 
like an improvised alarm clock. Rise and shine, another voice said. I opened my eyes to see my intake forms scattered around me on the floor in crumpled bits. I sat up, groggily rubbing my eyes and trying to make sense of what was happening. The woman from the front desk was nowhere in sight, and instead, I was met with the sight of a tall, lanky man standing before me in a hospital gown. He had a mop of greasy salt and pepper hair to match his beard, and I couldn't tell if it was curly or just matted, his eyes hidden behind a pair of sunglasses. Who are you? I asked, feeling a sense of unease wash over me. The man chuckled, his voice laced with amusement. Relax, buddy. I'm just here to check up on you. You look like you needed some help. I narrowed my eyes, feeling my pulse quicken. This didn't feel right, and I don't know what to do. Listen, I appreciate the concern, I said, slowly getting to my feet. But unless you're staff, I think I'll just head home. Wherever the receptionist went, she was apparently full of it. The man's expression changed, fear rising in his voice. You mean, you've seen her? Yeah, I said. She checked me in, or at least she was going to until... Wait, wait, wait. The stranger interrupted, getting a little too close. You mean to tell me you've seen the older woman sitting there scrolling on a notepad? He said, pointing at the desk. Yes, I answered exasperated. I don't know how old she was. I came in tonight, or was it last night by now? Anyways, she was the only one here for some reason, so I asked her to see a doctor, and she told me. She, she spoke to you? My pursuer interjected again as I headed for the doors. Yep, I replied, picking up my pace. I assume that's, you know, her job. She asked me to fill out those forms you so kindly trashed. Ah, he stopped. You must be something special, he said, giggling in a way that convinced me I was making the right decision. You've seen it, haven't you? He called after me. I stopped. You've been there before, I should say. The hell did you say? I asked, turning. You know, he answered, scurrying over. I don't know much, I retorted. But I know you're creeping me out. Look, I can't deal with this right now. I just need to go home and get some rest. Rest? He snickered. You won't be resting anytime soon, my friend. Not when you've seen what you've seen. As he moved close again, too close, I could smell the stench of alcohol and decay on his breath. The situation was getting out of hand, and I needed to get out of here fast. I tried to push past him, but he grabbed me by the shoulders, his grip tightening. You need to tell me everything, he demanded, his voice growing more and more frantic. What did you see? Did you see it? How did you get away? My mind raced with far more questions than answers. I had no idea what he was talking about, and I didn't want to stick around to find out. I mustered all of my strength and shoved him away, stumbling back towards the glass doors. I don't know, I yelled, and I don't want to know, I just want to leave. He let out a guttural laugh, his eyes glinting with madness. You can't leave, he said, his voice low and ominous. No one can leave. Haven't you realized that yet? I backed away from him, my heart racing. What are you talking about? I asked, my voice trembling. You work for the park too, don't you? He asked gleefully. I knew it. I tried to tell them, to warn everyone. Look, pal, I said, regaining my composure. I don't know who you are, but we both know you don't work for the park. Now, if you'll excuse me. I turned again and headed for the doors. I could see it was still dark out as I neared the exit, and I braced myself for the evening chill. As irritated as I was at having wasted so much time sitting there, I was by now relieved to be going home, finally. But as I stepped across the threshold, 
automatic doors whirring aside. I found myself face to face with the stranger again. The waiting room and reception spread before me at the end of the hall, where an empty parking lot should have been. I whirled around and saw another long hallway, another waiting room and reception desk dimly illuminated at the end. Told you nobody leaves, he said, grinning ear to ear. You son of a bitch, I seethed, lunging closer and grabbing a hold of my tormentor by the scruff of his filthy garb. He burst out crackling, the stench knocking me back. I'm not your enemy, pal. Accepting that is your only shot at getting out of here. I let go of his gown, jabbing my fingers in his face. I don't know who you are or what you are, I said fuming. But you've got five seconds to start making sense before I put you through the plate glass and make myself a door. I'm not in control of anything here, he retorted. Any more than you were in those woods. But I'm willing to bet since you made it out, you and I might have something in common. Who are you? I asked, hesitating. Ned Hoskins, National Forest Service, he said, extending a hand. How long's it been? Out there, I mean. Outside? I said quizzically, shaking his hand. Name's Jim. Well, Jim, nice to meet you. Ned smiled warmly. His discolored teeth seemed more pitiful than threatening now. Yes, outside, at the park. I gotta say, you are the second luckiest unlucky bastard I have ever met. Here or anywhere. If we could get you out of here and back there, you might just take top spot from me. I don't know what the hell any of that is supposed to mean, I scuffed. But yeah, the park is open. It's peak season right now. Ned shook his head. You know how it is here. I can't tell you the last time I've seen the sun. I get hungry and thirsty. I move around to find substance where I can. I sleep. I wake up over and over. But if it weren't for that, I could hardly tell time passes at all. Yeah, I said reluctantly. You were saying you could get me out of here, right? If I could get out of here, I would have by now, Jim. That much I could tell you for certain. The despair in his eyes seemed genuine, but it wasn't the answer I needed. All right, guess I'll have to make myself a door, I declared, moving in to hoist him up one last time. You think I haven't already tried that? Ned replied, shoving me aside. You think I haven't thrown myself and anything else I could lift through those floor-to-ceiling windows over there before? To escape to end it all? Or just to see what happens? Go right ahead and do it. You can't do any worse than this. He yanked open the hole in the side of his tattered hospital gown and showed me a jagged scar extending from under his arm on down, nearly to his torso. However tough you think you are, you can't launch me at any wall here that I haven't tried harder myself. I frowned, scanning the room, searching for any other exit. Nothing. As far as I could tell, the corridors leading out only led to more of the same. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could utter a word, Ned continued. I just transferred in from another park not too long before the headaches started. I didn't think anything of it at first, let alone whether there was any connection to the strange disappearances. Not too many more than typical, I would say, but enough to make you wonder. As new management, I just wanted to give a good impression to the team and not make too many waves. But eventually, you know, he trailed off. It all feels so long ago now. The first time it found me out there, I didn't even realize what was happening until I made it out. I kept thinking I was just imagining it, or that maybe I was losing my mind, but I could always feel this, this pull calling back to me. I'm not sure I follow, I ventured. This, Ned cried. I stared at him for a moment, resigning myself. I sauntered back to the nearest chair and crashed down in a heap, heaving a sigh. I'm trying to keep it together here, I said finally, 
lifting my head from my hands. What do you know about all of this? You said you work for the park? I've worked there for years. Never seen you before in my life. Eric's never mentioned you either, and he's... What did you just say? Ned practically leapt to my side with startling agility for a man in his condition. Eric? He stuttered. Not Eric Mathis. Yeah, that's him. I replied casually. Worked with him for years. Decent job, nice guy. Except for lately when he ditched me in the woods looking for some hikers. That's how I got stuck with that other place. Oh. Ned staggered back. Oh, no. What? I demanded, glancing around nervously. Ned laughed, settling into the seat across from me. You're screwed, my friend. You mentioned that. I shot back, annoyed. And I'm not your friend. Suit yourself, he replied, smiling. But your other friend, Eric, you... You don't really know what he is, do you? Of course I do, I shrugged. I just told you. And if he really worked at the park, he would have at least mentioned you to me. He's been running the place for as long as I've been there. I watched the color drain from Ned's face in response. That son of a bitch, he muttered, shaking. I take it you two didn't get along then, I snarked. Ned heaved a long sigh. I've been stuck here too long. That little bastard really went and turned the whole park into... Into... Into what? I asked. All of a sudden, Ned jumped to his feet. His agility once again giving me a more manic vibe than I was comfortable with. Shift change. He said in a low, terrified voice. Huh? I groaned in resignation. Let's get out of here, now! He replied frantically. Before I could even stand, he sprinted down the hall. It took every ounce of strength I had left to catch up with him. Hold up, I said as we zoomed past opening doors and the occasional window into adjacent rooms, spiking my adrenaline as I reached Ned's side. I arrived at an explanation of sorts, though only in the sense that scenes of writhing human bodies told me I needed to follow his advice. In contrast to the eerie silence of the hallway, a cacophony of screams seemed to fade in and out like an old TV signal as glimpses of incomprehensible amalgamations of human form confirmed their source. A seemingly endless row of rooms, large and small, scrolled past us like a live medical horror show. The doors were heavy in metal, their surfaces stained with rust and bloody handprints. Through the small windows, I caught glimpses of stainless steel tables, sharp surgical tools, and twisted forms of human bodies. The air was thick with the stench of death, blood, and decay. My nostrils burned as I tried to catch my breath between gasps, and the smell only grew stronger. There, Ned hissed, gesturing towards a stairwell exit. I followed him as he crashed through the door and down flights of stairs. At each one, he tugged on the door without success. Finally, we settled on the landing, huffing and puffing. What the hell? I heaved. Not yet, he answered, reaching out again for the door. This time it gave way, and we slipped inside, rushing the closet behind us. My guide's head was on a swivel, wide-eyed, but by all indications, the scene before us wasn't unlike what I found when I arrived. The both of us heaved a sigh of relief as we caught our breath. So, I said finally, any chance you're going to make sense of any of this? You've made it this far, Ned answered. Walk with me. I think I have something that will interest you. Part of me wondered if I should make a break for it but the rest of me couldn't come up with a destination. I followed him down the hallway past two or three of the same desk and waiting areas, until he stopped at what looked like a supply closet in one of the corridors. Opening it, he disappeared inside, 
leaving me standing in the hall and wondering whether or not any of this was worth it. I heard some shuffling and a scrapping sound in the dark before a match lit up the area. Come on! Ned beckoned towards an opening in the back wall. This is the place to be when this place starts acting up. Trust me, wandering around out there is the last thing you want to do. By this point, I could barely stand. My head was spinning, and a dull pain was beginning to spring behind my eyes. I don't know how long it's been since I had eaten properly or slept through the night. Any place to rest was better than the alternative. I followed Ned into the hidden room, my eyes adjusting to the dim, ethereal light that seemed to come from nowhere, just like what I had experienced in the woods. It was cramped and musty, but it seemed to have a fair amount of food and water stashed away. Ned lit a candle while I collapsed into a heap in the corner. Home sweet home, Ned sighed with satisfaction, closing the closet door and moving some boxes in front of the hole in the wall while I collapsed onto a pile of blankets in the corner. Thanks for sharing, I murmured. No trouble at all, my host grinned. You know how it is around here. Whenever you start hearing those god-awful screams coming from Eric's victims, it's time to get going. I'm not saying I know much about it, but I've noticed things get hairy whenever that receptionist you saw migrates from one floor to another, so I just call it a shift change. Things don't always work that way, mind you, but seeing as how you showed up, it must hunger for you something terrible. It? I asked. Yeah, Ned replied. It. When I was still running things at the park, Eric was just a snot-nosed trainee, always acting like he had something to prove from the get-go, trying to tell me and the other rangers what's what all the time, even when he didn't know what he was talking about. That's when this whole mess started. Still, it never occurred to me he was connected until it was too late. What do you mean, his victims? I interrupted. Those people and the missing people in the woods? Correct. Ned continued. I can't say for sure whether Eric lured every missing hiker, every lost camper to their doom, the way he did you and I. But I could tell you right now he's a sick, twisted man who's responsible for what you saw up there. Lured me. I raised an eyebrow. Nah, he has crews out there looking for me for weeks. He told me himself. I mean, if the goal was to make me like them, why send me here on my own? I don't know you, he interjected, and I don't know your story, but based on my experience with your friend, let me ask you which version makes more sense. That your boss, the guy who's been managing things for as long as you've been there, had no idea a cancerous malevolence spawned by an ancient evil existed right under his nose, found out only after you went missing and survived, dismissed your concerns, and just so happened to send you right back into it, here at the hospital, all by accident? Or could it be that your friend isn't who he says he is? That he's an evil megalomaniac who lures a bunch of us out into the woods like sacrificial animals to trade for his own purposes? After he failed to seal my fate, unlike the others, he doubled down, insisting I spread the rot like a sickness to the nearest hospital, under the auspice of getting me treatment. I stared at him for a moment. I drove myself here, was all I could muster. Then you are unlucky twice over, he chuckled. I don't know why some people, people like us, I suppose, come across it and live to tell the story. Maybe it's dumb luck, ironically. But now that I've met you, I'm more certain than ever it can't be. I'm telling you this because if there's any chance to make it out of here, you're the only one who could stop him. Stop all of this, Ned implored, motioning towards the door. For a while, I didn't say anything at all, partly due to exhaustion, partly because I was even more unsure of Ned's mental stability. After all, who knows how long he had been trapped in this place. It would have been more than enough to make anyone lose it. Still, though, I couldn't help myself. 
If there was any way for me to get out, I had to know more. What does the park have to do with this hospital? I asked. What does anything Eric is doing to the park have to do with you getting stuck here? Well, like I said, I think I might have something that interests you. He replied, pulling a tattered notebook out of a box. It was worn and frayed with years of use. The cover wrinkled and faded. As he held it out to me, the pages shifted and threatened to fall out. The musty smell of the old paper and mildew made me wonder if I could stand to be interested in it to begin with. All guesswork, of course. He shrugged. But I've had nothing to do but think about how I got here and how to get out. If there's a way, I've tried. But it might give you some of the answers you're looking for. The place wasn't like this when I got here. And I can't recall now when things began to change. I checked myself in, same as you did. Spent a couple of days being evaluated after everything it does to you. He pointed at his face and I shuddered. Remembering the first time I had seen myself in the mirror since finding my way back. Then at some point, time starts to blur together. And before I knew it, I couldn't leave. Things have only gotten worse ever since. My god, I responded. So this decay, it spreads from place to place? I asked, hardly believing the words coming out of my mouth. That's the best way I could describe it, yeah, he nodded. Even if you manage to escape, you should be careful where you spend your time. I think once you've been touched, so to speak, it stays with you. I've only seen the entity at the center of all this when Eric insisted that we should all head out there into the woods together looking for the missing people. Difficult to describe. The body of a man, the head of a dog, or maybe a goat? I remember hoofs, sharp teeth, fur, something like a twisted avatar of nature itself. I couldn't get a good look at it before I passed out from these splitting headaches you get. By the time I came to, the creature was gone and Eric had found me. Even after he drove me here to the hospital and for a good while longer, I still thought he had saved me. You showing up just confirms my suspicions. He must be feeding it. This monster of yours? I ventured. It eats people? And the people I found in the woods, the people upstairs, what about them? That's not what I mean, Ned paused. I mean to say... The madness of the void rots more than the mind and body. The world around us, too. What if this thing, camped out in the woods, is spreading it somehow, feeding off of it? That doesn't make any sense, I sighed. But I'm sorry you've been stuck here for so long, I can't even imagine. He shrugged. There isn't much happening to either of us that makes any sense. Hopefully, imagining it is the worst you'll experience. With that, my bizarre new acquaintance simply turned and laid down to sleep without another word. I stifled a chuckle and looked down at the tattered notebook. My mind raced and yet I was near passing out myself. I'd yet to learn anything that might help me escape. Part of me was screaming to get back out there and find a way out before Ned woke up and decided I was the one behind his predicament after all. But physically... I couldn't resist the urge to sleep much longer. I decided to compromise and take a look at the notebook. It was filled with scrawled text and drawings, some of which were so faded and smudged that I couldn't make out what they were. But as I read on, I began to piece together a picture consistent to what he described. Moreover, the similarities between our experiences, the headaches, the disappearances, Discovering this phenomenon in the woods shook me to my core. And yet, still nothing about a way to escape it. Overwhelmed, I must have drifted off soon after, because the next thing I remember is opening my eyes to a large rat staring back at me, curiously. I'm not sure which was a more effective wake-up call, the unwelcome guest or the realization that Ned was gone. Panic crept up my spine as I scanned the small space for any sign of where he went. 
The rat scurried away as I tossed aside the notebook and crawled out into the closet. I rose, stumbling as my legs shook my stiffened frame. I steadied myself against the wall and took a few deep breaths. The door to the room was still closed, but I was suddenly struck with the feeling that I was not alone. Ned? I whispered, hoping he was just outside the door. There was no response. I took a step towards it, my heart pounding in my chest. I wasn't ready for what greeted me on the other side. Sunlight glinted off a sheet of aluminum that ascended the ruin in front of me. I staggered back in shock, raising my hands to my face. What the? I muttered, trying to process the scene. I looked back to the hollow space behind the wall where I had eventually spent the night. But no amount of time could explain the difference between the hospital I slept in and the long abandoned ruin I was now standing in. I took a step forward, trying to grab the reality of the situation. The walls were warped and damp, in the air thick with the smell of rot and decay. Struggling to understand, I looked around, desperately trying to reorient myself from where I'd been to the place I now found myself. It was as if a tornado had blown through the place without waking me. I continued onward reluctantly, realizing I was somehow on the ground floor. Nearing the rusted frame where the doors had been in disbelief, I hesitated, turning back for a moment, unsure of what I would find on the other side. But sure enough, I found myself reaching to shield my eyes from the sun that had peeked in through the holes in the collapsing upper floors. My truck sat innocently some distance away, tracks leading off into the woods. I turned back again, increasingly disoriented. When I was certain had been the same hospital I casually strolled into not long ago, was now an unrecognizable ruin. Years of plant growth and decay devoured a structure that still stretched suspiciously high. I was almost as shocked as I had escaped poor Ned's eternal prison as I was this place hadn't collapsed on me, unsure how long I'd been there. I wondered if I dare be grateful that at least there was no humanoid terrors beyond comprehension or strange, shrieking monsters to worry about here. Still, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by it all, clinging just as desperately to the notion that I could still figure all this out and get my life back, so long as I kept moving. I made a beeline for my truck, determined not to let my reservations trap me in this place a second longer than necessary. Still, I couldn't help but pause when I saw the sign it had obscured. Just beyond, defiant against the natural world determined to reclaim it, was a name I could just make out. Ravenwood Hospital. A glimmer of hope told me this proved I was not where I thought I was, because until that moment, I could have convinced anyone I was in Mountain View, somewhat 15 miles from the park. The relief I felt when the engine roared to life was cut short when I realized I was, nevertheless, in the middle of nowhere. I'd heard about Ravenwood, an asylum for the criminally insane, but it had closed down decades ago when the park expanded. No matter how exhausted or sick I may have been, there was no way I had driven all the way out here from the visitor center. Not by accident, and never mind mistaking abandoned ruins for a hospital. I rolled forward, cautiously following the tire tracks that were my only way out. It was all I could focus on, aside from the suppressing the panic that crept up whenever they disappeared and reappeared like dots to connect. For what seemed like hours, I glanced nervously between the windshield and the fuel gauge, driving through and around an obstacle course of rugged terrain cross-cut by streams, rocky crags, an impassable forest. From what I could remember, Ravenwood shouldn't have been too far from the only road I could have taken this way from the visitor center. 
but that assumed I was heading in anything resembling the right direction. By the time I saw the outline of an old ranger station on the horizon, I was running on fumes. I had no choice but to make my way there as soon as possible. The old cabin looked like it hadn't been used in years. The paint on the wooden exterior was so faded it was nearly gone. The door was hanging off its hinges, and I could see the nature's green reaching up from the earth to swallow the structure from all sides. The thought of spending time there was not exactly reassuring, but it was the only shelter for miles, and I had no way to be certain of where I was. Finding Randy and John there when I pulled up had to use just about any luck I had left. They stared in bewilderment as I stepped out, and I did my best to smile and act as though nothing was amiss. If anything, Ned told me about Eric was true. I had no way to know who else might be involved. Hi there, I called out, hoping to convince them in spite of myself. What are you doing all the way out here? I should be asking you the same thing, John replied, stepping off the ladder as Randy set down his shovel. I approached casually, shrugging my shoulders. You know, the usual. Bob and Eric asked me to take a look at some dead areas we may need to clear, and I suppose I got a little turned around. The three of us approached, and I could see confusion and skepticism on their faces. That's weird, Randy said. Just last week, Eric told us that you were on sick leave until further notice. Said you were so sick, we shouldn't even try to contact you. Yeah, John agreed. You're back already? He never mentioned it. I broke their gaze nervously, caught off guard. If I had lost an entire week, there was no hope of hiding my condition from my workers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I chuckled. I guess so. Randy continued. You don't look so good, no offense. No worries, I sang. Try not to sound desperate. I suppose this job really takes it out of me. But yeah, I'm back at it. What about you? John hesitated. We hiked out, been doing some trail maintenance, and now we're fixing up this old cabin before the snow this winter makes it impossible. Great, I smiled. You mind if I lend a hand? I'm afraid I used up all my fuel just finding my way back here. I was looking for the main road and... Randy raised an eyebrow. Jim, the main road is miles from here. Are you sure you're all right? I shrugged, still trying to keep it together. Yeah, never better. What gives? Okay. John interjected, diffusing the situation. Sure, Jim. Glad to have the help. He handed me an axe. I was going to start gathering dry timber to restock the firewood, but you could go ahead and get a head start since you've already been out looking. Sure, I'd be happy to. I smiled, reaching out. I racked my brain trying to think of where to go, what to do next. Grateful I had managed to smooth things over. But I was sorely mistaken. Before I could take it, Randy snatched the axe from John's hand, spun it around and raised it over his head. The realization hit me too late, and I had hardly raised my hand and stepped back before he raised the back of the axe head down on my head. I flinched, but he managed to clip the side of my head, knocking me to the ground. I groaned and instinctively tried the stand. John shoved Randy back, berating him. What the hell, Randy? Not like this. Screw you, John. Randy shot back, raising the axe again. John grabbed it and tried to wrestle the murder weapon from his hands. We don't even know how he ended up here. He wasn't supposed to make it back. What exactly are we going to tell Eric if you kill him now? Randy didn't even get a chance to respond. I hurled myself at him, still somewhat dazed, desperate to put up a fight. John yanked the axe free as I crashed into Randy, and the two of us tumbled to the ground, cursing and thrashing. I nearly had him pinned, and I thought about how much time I should spend beating on him before making a break for my truck. It was then that I felt something hard and heavy make contact with the back of my skull, sending sharp pain and nausea shooting through my body. I collapsed to my side in a fetal position. 
reaching back and felt warm liquid gushing from the open wound. I gagged as the world spun into darkness. When I came to, I couldn't move. My head was killing me, and not just because of the gash still oozing blood from the back of my head. I stifled my gut reflex, not wanting my nausea to draw attention. The cold draft blew in through gaps in the walls of the cabin, pricking my senses. I was lying on the floor in the corner, my hands and feet zip-tied. Despite the disoriented state I was in, I could feel my heart rate quicken as I tried to focus on my surroundings. I could hear the wind howling and the distant sound of water rushing over rocks from a nearby stream. My captors were still bickering over what to do with me. We can't just leave him out here, John groaned. Eric was adamant that he had been chosen. Then what's he doing here? Randy asked. You don't honestly believe that crap your boss drones on about, do you? What part of the cosmic madness of true knowledge is so compelling? If Eric wants him gone so bad, let's just dump him. It'll be our secret. Nobody else needs to know. No, John insisted. This is the second time Jim's made it back somehow. He'll want to handle this personally, like he did with the old boss. Randy sighed. Whatever. The guy's a nutcase, and for all I know, your friend Jim is too. This wasn't what I signed up for when my parole officer told me this place paid cash for a day's work. Now you got me in the middle of nowhere on a three-day hike talking about some ritual. I'm not going back to prison for whatever you and the rest have going on. Even if I wanted to get him back to Eric, I'm sure as hell not dragging him there on foot. Relax, John said. You'll get your money. I got a hold of Eric on the sat phone. If he can convince the crew to fly him out here by helicopter, it won't be that long. My blood ran cold. It didn't sound like I had much time to get out of there somehow. But if I moved a muscle, I'd immediately give myself away. To make matters worse, I was fighting a losing battle with my bladder. I had one move, and I made it. Hey you! I spat, trying to make the gravel and my voice sound determined. The hell is your problem? John stood up surprised. Well, look at that, Randy. You managed not to kill him, yet. Randy scuffed. Whatever, man. You're the one who put him down. What do we do now? Let me go, I answered. Unless you want me to piss all over your floor. Just let me outside for a bit. I bet you boys like the watch anyways. The three of us argued for a minute before John marched over, exasperated, and yanked through the zip ties around my wrists with his pocket knife. There, he grinned. Hop on out. We'll give you some privacy. You got 60 seconds. I rolled my eyes, struggling to my feet. Fine, I groaned. As I hobbled towards the door, Randy opened it for me, bowing sarcastically and motioning with his hand. Enjoy, he giggled. I had half a mind to stomp on his toes as I hopped past, but he kicked my bound feet from under me, and I went sprawling helplessly into the dirt outside. The pair roared with laughter as I cussed and spat, rolling around. So much for my escape plan. I sheepishly made my way to the farther corner of the cabin where I could lean for balance. My momentary relief was nearly interrupted by a distant chopping sound coming over the horizon. Time was not on my side. Bracing hard against the walls, I leapt into the air and threw my legs against a sharp edge along the corner, aiming for the gap where my plastic restraints bound them together. One by one, the zip ties snapped, but not before I gave myself a few bruises. Still, before long, I was free. What's all that racket, Jim? I said 60 seconds. John called after me, stepping outside. It was now or never. Quickly gathering my strength, I ran around the side of the cabin at full tilt, determined to make it to my truck. I could hear John and Randy shouting as they ran after me, their voices diverging as one of them no doubt tried to beat me there from the other side. 
I rounded the corner to the back where I'd parked. My head was still pounding, and all the commotion had got my blood pumping. I could feel wet, warm ooze making its way down my neck and back, but I couldn't let it slow me down. I could just make out the wide-eyed rage on John's face as he rounded the corner opposite me, and we both made a beeline for my truck. I was close enough to be confident I would reach it before my pursuer, and a spark of hope picked up my speed. But my hopes were dashed by the blur of grass and dirt. I tripped and went sprawling onto the ground, hard. I tried to jump up, but a sharp pain shot through my leg from my ankle and sent me right back down. By then, John caught up with me, huffing and puffing. I still struggled to stand, right up until his boot came crashing into my teeth. I lurched backward involuntary, the taste of metallic nausea mixing with the sharp pain flooding my shocked senses. Landing hard on my back, I could do little more than raise my hands to shield myself as he loomed over me. You slippery son of a bitch! John shook his head, still panting. No more bathroom breaks for you. His words were nearly drowned out by the roar of the helicopter approaching the cabin from the other side. I couldn't see anything from where I was lying on the ground, but I knew Eric had arrived. You're lucky. I can't be sure you'd survive another blow to the head. John seethed menacingly. I cried out and tried to turn and crawl away as he landed a few more blows stomping down on my twisted ankle. Stay down, and this will all go much easier, he said, kicking me in the ribs. I gagged, my breath cut short with each thud. This is it, I thought. I laid there helpless, anticipating the final blow, but it never came. Randy, John bellowed. Tell Eric I got his buddy here around back. As pathetic as it sounds, I almost felt relieved to see my old friend appear after some time from the other side of the cabin, the whirling blades of the helicopter rising and fading as quickly as they had come. He broke into a trot, calling out, Jim? What did you guys do to him, John? Jim, are you alright? I laid there on the ground, silent as he approached. Nothing that didn't need doing, John replied. Unless you'd rather have him ruin your plans for a third time. You fool, Eric raged. The sacrifice must remain unblemished if it's to be accepted. Wasn't much of anything unblemished about him when he got here, John insisted. I don't know how, but you sure are lucky Randy and I were here when he did. Did you forget what it is we're trying to accomplish here? How's your daughter's chemotherapy going, John? Didn't you say she's getting worse? That you would do anything? Eric stared daggers as I watched all the fight leave John's eyes. If you're going to kill him here, you might as well start planning two funerals. Eric continued. Now help me get him onto the sled. I brought Sarah and Ron. I'll haul Jim out of here myself, and this time, you're all coming with me. If you're lucky, I'll let you do the honors when the time comes. Now? John protested. It's nearly dark, and it looks like you brought the snow with you. Whatever you're doing, you won't be getting through these woods. Eric chuckled. Where we're going, it is as the prophet said. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Right. John hesitated. I'll go get Randy. Eric offered some food and water, crudely stitching the gash on my head while the others gathered for what looked to be a considerable undertaking. Whatever happened next, I was too injured to move much on my own, never mind escape. The snow was coming down in earnest by the time I was wrapped and tied to a sled, like a dying member of some expedition into the wilderness. John wasn't the only one having second thoughts. Randy refused to go. I don't know what your problem is with Jim, and I don't want to know, he said flatly. I don't care if I have to walk out of here myself. I'm not going with you, and I'm not going back to prison for whatever this is. He stood defiant, arms crossed. Suit yourself, our dearranged leader replied. You could pick up your check from the office. 
Randy rolled his eyes, turned to head back to the cabin from where we had gathered. The wind began to pick up, moaning through the trees and filling the air with just enough fresh powder to give his exit a dramatic flare. Not a moment later, Eric turned, reaching in his pack, and pulled out a pistol. Before anyone could say a word, he fired. Three shots exploded through Randy's back, and he dropped like a rock into the red snow. The others stood in shock, as motionless as I was, while Eric calmly stowed the murder weapon. Any other questions or concerns? He called out to the wind. Good. John, Sarah, and Ron quietly picked up the gear and followed a man who may easily have become their killer into the woods as he lugged me behind with a rope. No matter how long I stared at them, I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't jump him all at once, or at least make a break for it. What on earth could he hold over them? Surely they didn't hate me enough to risk their lives butchering me in some psychotic charade. Before long, Eric's voice interrupted my thoughts. So, Jim, he huffed, his words only somewhat audible over the grinding of my makeshift prison over the lightly covered forest floor. I understand you went to the wrong hospital. I told you you should have taken my offer. He laughed as if expecting a response. I didn't. He continued. You know, old friend, that's a very special place. I wasn't even certain it existed until he told me about what had happened to you. But places like that only attract people like that, so you could believe me when I tell you what happened wasn't my plan. Not at first, anyways. It's thinner there, the veil between this life and the oblivion we all yearn for, and yearns for us. Places of death and suffering long forgotten. Some people, many people like us, the broken, the anguished, the despaired. They can cross it sometimes. After all, blessed are the meek, for all they shall inherit the earth. Was Ned one of these meek souls of yours? I interrupted struggling to speak against the pain that cut through every breath. Is that why you trapped him in that place? Eric stopped in his tracks for a moment and glanced back at me. Ah, uh, so the bastard is still there. He crackled even harder. You know what? I'm glad you two had a chance to catch up. You really are meant for this. For what? I asked weakly. For what billions of people today and throughout history have sought after religiously, he answered. The sublime oblivion of absolute enlightenment. The formless void of infinity beyond the natural world, where mere existence breaks the mind under the cosmic weight of truth. I probably should have anticipated it by now, but I immediately regretted asking. It went on like that for some time, and I tuned most of it out in silence. I heard enough to know Ned was right. I was to be offered up like some fresh meat to the nightmare I fought so hard to get away from, showing its relentless, inevitable devouring of the world as we know it. Somehow, this was supposed to confer a reprieve from its effects upon those willing to present someone else in their place. At least, that was Eric's version of the story I gleaned from all the gibberish. It was pitch black out and everyone had mag lights on, determined to get wherever they were taking me. I'd assumed they would make camp at some point, but it never came. By the time I saw the first rays of a strange glow piercing through the trees, I assumed morning had come. I told myself the intense quiet was just an adjustment to the howling wind and snow that had ceased but the uncanny weight of dread in my gut was matched only by the growing knowledge of the otherworldly landscape that had unfolded around me. For the first time, I fought as hard as I could, though helplessly against my restraints. I groaned and struggled through the pain radiating through my body. The intensity of my headache was reaching a fever pitch, and I knew all too well what it meant. My efforts barely interrupted my captor's monologues. Desperation became full-blown panic when the faded belongings of my ill-fated predecessors came into view, scattered about. 
They paraded past my traps, gaze on all sides, a grim prelude to my fate. Shattered ribs intermingled my screams with choking, coughing, and sputtering as I involuntarily fought for air, for release, for freedom. The group came to a halt, and when I saw why, I nearly soiled myself. There it was. The tree that Psychopath thought so highly of. The one I knew firsthand was no tree at all. It was even more massive than I remembered it, and I squeezed my eyes shut tightly, trying anything to avoid seeing that monstrosity in detail a second time. The discordant moans of countless voices trapped in eternal agony grew in a crescendo, as if in anticipation. Eric looked gleeful in a maniac sort of way. He grinned, wide-eyed, with shaky hands that now struggled to untie me. Even then, it seemed he never tired of hearing himself talk, almost shouting over the hellish chorus. What would you trade for knowledge, Jim? Prometheus stole it from the gods. Odin plucked out one eye for it. Adam fortified his very soul. As for me, well, I would burn the whole world and more. Some call it Odin's tree, others the tree of life, Nirvana. Can't you feel it? It hungers for those whose souls are prepared. Even a god hung himself here for a chance at what I'm giving you. And yet, you try to flee? But not this time. I will fulfill my oath once more and claim what is rightfully mine. I couldn't hear much of what he said after that, and I couldn't have understood much even if I did. I was nearly paralyzed by the pounding in my head. I struggled with everything left in me just to avoid passing out. At some point, Eric must have untied me because I found myself rolling around on the strange ground. I remember the slimy sensation of the disgusting mucus oozing from the tree in places, fluorescent, pulsing mold of some kind in others. The voices had become so loud, so intense and all-encompassing. Their increasingly high-pitched, inhuman wail that reverberated through everything around could only be the same formless threat I had narrowly escaped from the first time I encountered it in this place. The sound resonated in a hum that seemed to come from everywhere. I frantically tried the roll, to crawl, to writhe, and flail away from that place at any cost. Through the blur of tears and with hands clapped together over my ears, I caught glimpses of the carnage. One moment I saw John smiling. No, giggling uncontrollably as he pranced around naked and covered in blood. He moved to and from, dancing in his own intestines he wrapped himself around like a string of blood-red pearls. The next, Ron and Sarah came in the view, each half butchered and fro-licking to a beat of their own. Their faces appeared ecstatic to see the pack of beasts emerging from the woods around us, even after it set upon them and began tearing all three to shreds. Humanoid yet canine in shape, their thick black fur was soon splattered with generous helpings of blood and viscera dripping from razor-sharp teeth that gleamed in the dim light. Amidst the chaos, Eric stood alone just out of reach, the same wild eyes, psychotic grin on his face, as if the mass murder unfolded around us was the most wonderful surprise anyone could receive. My hands fell from my ears as I laid on the ground. I could feel the last of my strength and will leaving my body as the familiar hum of the pulsating alien world washed away the steady drumbeat of agony in my skull. In that moment, I almost surrendered to the dreamy abyss trying to close my eyes forever. I stared at the man who had caused all this, who ruined my life and murdered so many people for some quest. He had been my friend. I trusted him perhaps even more than the victims whose remains now littered the floor. I couldn't just let go, not until I had my revenge. Slowly, methodically, I raised myself up, one limb at a time. Eric was oblivious, lost in the ecstasy of the massacre he orchestrated. With each movement, I willed myself through the searing pain. Finally, 
I turned to face him, preparing my body for one last act. Mustering every ounce of rage and despair I had, I let out a defiant cry, lunging at him when he was only half turned to face me. The two of us crashed into the broad, slime-covered flesh base of the tree. It was my would-be killer's turn to scream and struggle, but his body was immobilized, like vermin in a glue trap. Despite sinking in further myself, I grabbed my hands around his throat and squeezed as hard as I could. That was it. I had no hope of escape, but neither did my tormentors. A head-spinning mix of terror and triumph flooded my final moments, though I can't remember if I had managed to kill Eric with my own hands before I passed out for good. When I awoke on the forest floor, I assumed I was dead, that I had finally crossed over into the formless void that had been my nightmares in life. However, I began to have my doubts when I effortlessly rose to my feet. As far as I could tell, my injuries had vanished without a trace, along with Eric and the rest. Were it not for the gear laying around nearby, I may have doubted my sanity and whether any of it really happened. There was no indication of the events that haunted my last memories, and I found his pistol in the bag where he had stashed it, along with the sat phone. It didn't take me long to reach someone at headquarters, though we spent more time trying to figure out where I was to send for help before the battery ran low. In the weeks that followed, I was subjected to a criminal investigation into the disappearances of the people who tried to kill me. The authorities were determined, and I'm not sure I wouldn't have been charged if they had been able to find Randy's body. Weeks of manhunts with crews scurried the park with no sign of him or anyone else, and the case eventually went cold for lack of evidence. I wish I could say my story ends here, that I defeated the evil and saved the world through grit, luck, and sheer commitment to my mission, but that would be a lie. My miraculous recovery feels more profound than even my previous narrow escapes. It's not just my wounds that disappeared. The aches, the pains, the wrinkles, the weakness and exhaustion, all gone. Constant headaches were replaced with vivid nightmares of the tree that isn't a tree, and strange voices murmuring in a language I can't quite understand. I feel more alive than ever, but at a cost. I can feel its pull through my dreams, its rhythm beckoning like a heartbeat. Eric was a bastard but I think I know what I have to do. I guess that's why I've shared all this. So if you ever find yourself in my position, you will too. I'm a park ranger. I patrol the national forests of Kentucky. Today I was called on to the scene, a valley deep outside public trails barely touched. Helicopter thought they saw an unmarked camp, so they sent me out on the ground. The scene was a bloodbath. Streaks of it all over the ground. The bears started swarming soon after. This was recent. Looking around, I eventually found a notebook. Blood splatter all over, but still legible. I read the last entry as I walked around the camp. I have edited out some of the random asides and drug use, but I can't keep this inside anymore. I need someone to know. December 13th. I was in between houses. I guess that's a good way to put it. The job market had dried up in my little town, and when you're three months late on rent, you can understand why the landlord decided to show you the door. I never thought backpacking would be the answer, and I suppose it really isn't in the dead of winter, but here I was. All my remaining possessions were on my back, and the National Forest seemed as good a place as any to try and settle down. Upon the side of a mountain, through an untouched forest, and 15 miles later, I found myself at a clearing. The ring of trees circled the valley, a small lake nestled in the middle, I thought this was it. 
I set up my home base and threw a few lines out. A few trout obliged my hooks, and with that I had enough for the night. That night the fire warmed my soul just enough, and the fire roasted fish filled my stomach. At this point in my life, it's the best I could have asked for. December 18th Then I saw the shadow. I first saw him a few days ago. Breaking through the edge of the forest beyond the lake, the dark figure just stood. I waved, expecting it to be another camper in a situation like mine, but it never moved. The corners of my vision have been failing me for many years, so I suspected it was a trick of the light. Whenever I wandered over there, it was gone. I'm in my 50s, so I didn't think much of it. Maybe my body was taking much longer to adjust to the mountain air. December 20th. He showed up at my camp. I was starting my fire for the day, and as the embers grew to a blaze, I saw him sitting across from me. I thought he might be trying to say hello, but the complete and utter stillness this thing had was unnerving. I yelled at him to get out of here, and he was gone. Whether I was insane in the mountain air, or something more sinister was afoot, I was never a strong believer in the supernatural after all. The next day, I made my trek around the lake and through the woods, following the shadow man. No sign of him. I walked into the brush, cracking my way through a dense mesh of briar or something close to it. I pushed through until I reached another high clearing. Something felt wrong though. The trees stopped growing, almost in a perfect circle, and in the center, a door. It wasn't a house door, closer to the wrought iron sides of a tank shrouded in a deep layer of concrete, but poking out amongst the dead foliage surrounding it. I felt something, a twing. My breathing had become long and wet. I chalked it up to the hike. I probably hit some allergen on the way up. A breeze washed through the valley, and I looked up at the door as it swung open, the shade sitting atop. That was it. I had to. I was into this, and I was going to see it through to the end. I shouldn't have gone down that hall. I don't know if it would have helped. December 21st. I checked out the hall, but it was dark. Long staircase went down into the earth, and it was pitch black. I hooked up a lantern after dinner. Today I'm going in. December 22nd. I've been trying to use the light I have to explore down there. I haven't seen the shade, though I guess he wouldn't look like much of anything down there. Man, I should have reapplied sunscreen. I am burning up here. I'll try to stay out of the sun today. Won't be much of a problem with that. I went deep, down spiked hallways like nothing I've ever seen. The signs are kinda eerie, with symbols and stuff between English. Basic keep out stuff I would expect to see at any cattle ranch in town. December 23rd. I coughed up blood last night. I'm not feeling terrible, but I just have this terrible burn. I needed to go back, and I did further this time. I used a line hooked up to the door to lead me back, and I went all in. Nothing but dirt and more dirt. At the end of the hall, there's a little metal ball. I tried to touch it, but it was pretty hot. Must be one of those flukes. I'll come back tomorrow. December 24th. Christmas Eve. What a joke. God gave me nothing, and we expect to worship that? No, I'm going in again. Last night, I woke up with excruciating pain in my hands. The skin had started to peel, and I saw bruising all over. This felt like more of a burn. December 25th. My body is decaying. I woke up again. Hell, I didn't sleep. I felt a pain in my right index finger. My hand. It just went on instinct. 
I grabbed my finger, and like a wet sock, the blood squelched and my fingernail laid in my hand, blood dripping from the wound. I wrapped it all up in a bandage. I don't think I feel pain after that. The way I see it, I'm dying regardless. I might as well get that thing while I'm at it. This is my last message. If you find this, leave. You don't want this. I ain't coming out of that cave. Learn from me. The final journal entry looked barely scrawled, pinned in a deep crimson tone. His blood had soaked through the last lines. He wrote what was on the walls. I knew I shouldn't, but I have to. I walked to the clearing, up through the briars, and saw it. The door was there. The shades sitting on top. It was real. Part of me thought the old man had gone crazy, but I saw the thing as clear as day, or as clear as a shadow can be. I walked into the room, down the hallway, and saw it. A pool of blood. No, it was a man. Bones stuck out, muscles fused, and the ungulating mass that used to be the man laid there, barely even human anymore. I turned my flashlight around, glanced at the page. The light had highlighted the pen ink under the blood. I read it, matching the text to the splattered English on the walls. This place is a message. Pay attention to it. Sending this message was important to us. We considered ourselves to be a powerful culture. This place is not a place of whore. No highly esteemed deed is commemorable here nothing valued in here. What is here is dangerous and repulsive. This is a message about danger. The danger is unleashed only if you substantially disturb this place physically. This place is best shunned and left uninhabited. Something struck me about those lines. I'd heard them somewhere before, but I can't put my finger on it. That changed, however, when I saw the symbol. The pinwheel, three prongs emanating from the center. I ran. By the time I got back to the car, I was already covered in blisters, my face feeling the most intense burn I'd ever felt. I've been around forest fires, and that didn't feel like anything compared to this. When I got in the town, I collapsed on the wheel. Doctors say I have a week left. I know I'm not going to make it a day. Cancer. I don't know if this message is a goodbye, but I don't have the stomach to tie the rope. But I need to leave the world with something. Anything. You don't need to explore these empty clearings of the mountains. They kill slow, but they kill all the same.